George Washington led them all, not just in battle, but in spirit. That more or less represented what the American Revolution was all about. On the diplomatic front, Benjamin Franklin lobbies France to enter into a formal alliance. Will you fight? Soldiers perished in the forge, more than in any single battle during the Revolution. It'll be their last chance for plotting a comeback. The year is 1777. It's been four years since the Boston Tea Party. Three years since Paul Revere rode out shouting, The British are coming! The British are coming! On his journey known as the Portsmouth Alarm. The shots heard around the world happened just two years prior at Lexington and Concord. The first shots which ignited the Revolutionary War. News spread fast and thousands of volunteers converged which formed the beginnings of the Continental Army. In June 1775, the man that would lead the Continental Army against the British Redcoats, General and Commander in Chief of the Army of the United Colonies and of all forces raised or to be raised by them. General George Washington was appointed to lead the Continental Army. In the years leading up to the winter encampment at Valley Forge, the area was used as a small industrial community. The Mount Joy Iron Forge was established in 1742. The community expanded. Mills were established, ironworks, and houses for the residents. The surrounding area consisted of rich farmland by mainly Welsh Quaker farmers. Valley Forge was a peaceful place where cattle, sheep, and pigs roamed the fields. Corn, rye, wheat, and hay was grown. In the summer of 1777, the Continental Army established a magazine at Valley Forge. Continental Army Quartermaster General Thomas Milfin chose this area due to its secluded location in between hills. A portion of the Army supplies were stored in the outbuildings surrounding the forges. With the British landing in Elkton, Maryland on August 25, 1777, the British Army left the Chesapeake Basin and headed towards Valley Forge. The Battle of Brandywine was fought September 11, 1777. It was a British victory. A week later, the supplies at Valley Forge were raided. Lieutenant Colonel Alexander Hamilton and Captain Henry Lighthorse Harry Lee tried to evacuate the supplies. The supplies were captured and destroyed and the forges in other building and Valley Forge were set ablaze. After the summer was over, the leaves started to change and the temperature dropped. General Washington met with his officers to make a decision where the Continental Army would encamp that winter. The majority of the fighting during the 18th century was done in the summer months. In the winter, armies dug in until spring or early summer. This would be the third winter encampment during the Revolutionary War. After the summer was over, General Washington received recommendation from his officers as well as politicians on where to camp. The Continental Congress expected the army would camp at a site that would protect Philadelphia. General Washington considered the arguments, but Valley Forge sat high on terrain. An attack from the British would be difficult. Soldiers could disperse more quickly to defend the countryside. The Schuylkill River could be used for supply movements. The area had open fields that could be used to drill and train his troops. It was decided. George Washington took his 12,000 strong army to Valley Forge on December 19, 1777. Washington also ordered 2,000 soldiers to encamp at Wilmington, Delaware. The army mounted troops were sent to Trenton, New Jersey, as well as additional outposts at Downington and Radnor, Pennsylvania. In Washington's two prior winter encampments, the army sheltered in tents and huts, as well as civilian barns and other outbuildings. George Washington wrote later about the march into Valley Forge. To see men without clothes to cover their nakedness, without blankets to lay on, without shoes by which their marches might be traced by the blood from their feet, and almost as often without provisions, as with marching through frost and snow and at Christmas, taking up the winter quarters, to within a day's march the enemy, without a house or hut to cover them up, till they could be built or submitting to it, without a murmur is a mark of patience and obedience, in my opinion, can scarce be paralleled. Valley Forge would be the first time Washington ordered the army to move into a permanent camp 
where they would construct their own shelters. No accurate account for the number of huts exist, but experts estimate that between 1,300 and 1,600 huts were built. Letters written by George Washington and other Continental Army soldiers are the only accounts of what took place. Brigadier generals appointed officers from each regiment to mark out the spots every officer and enlisted men's huts. Commanders attempted to standardize the huts, but archaeological evidence shows that the huts deferred in size, materials, and construction techniques. Some of the huts had their floors dug almost two feet deep below the ground level to reduce the amount of logs needed and to reduce wind exposure. Some of the roofs were made from straw, others of brush, canvas, and clapboards. Lafayette described the huts as small barracks, which are scarcely more cheerful than dungeons, in a letter to his wife. The Continental Army suffered severe supply problems. There were 12,000 soldiers, officers, women, and children. There were only four cities in the entire 13 colonies that exceeded that number. The Continental Congress had authorized the reorganization of the supply department, but it never took into effect because of the fighting surrounding Philadelphia. The supply chain had completely broken down. George Washington had no way to feed or close his soldiers. That winter, more than a thousand soldiers and around 1,500 horses died from starvation. Washington ordered the rations include either one and one and a half pounds of flour or bread, one pound of salted beef or fish, or three quarters pound of salted pork, or one and one half pounds of flour or bread, and a half pound of bacon or salted pork, and a half pound of peas or beans, and one grill of whiskey or spirits. Unfortunately, the army could not reliably supply this full ration. Perishable items would rot before reaching the troops due to transportation problems, poor storage, and at the time it took to travel to the camp. Rations were sometimes lost, stolen, or destroyed by the enemy. Traveling to the markets proved dangerous, and combined with the Continental Army's lack of hard currency and the prices for perishable goods being inflated. The soldiers often had to make do by making fire cakes, a tasteless mixture of flour and water cooked upon heated rocks. Joseph Plum Martin wrote this in his memoir, to go into the wild woods and build us habitations to stay in such a weak, starved, and naked condition was appalling in the highest degree. The men felt extreme resentment towards those deemed responsible for their hardship. Washington wrote to the President of the Continental Congress, Henry Lawrence, on December 23rd. He wrote how his commanders had to quell dangerous mutinies because of the lack of provisions. Washington issued a warning to Congress. Unless some great and capital change suddenly takes place in that line, the army must inevitably be reduced to one other of these three things. Starve, dissolve, or disperse in order to obtain substance in the best manner they can. George Washington was definitely suffering to feed his army, and the situation was dire, but it is believed he may have exaggerated this to obtain a quick response from Continental Congress. Many of the men in the winter at Valley Forge were unfit for duty, due to disease and lack of proper clothing and uniforms. Lafayette wrote this about the men's condition at Valley Forge years later. The unfortunate soldiers were in want of everything. They had neither coats, hats, shirts, nor shoes. Their feet and legs froze till they had become black, and it was often necessary to amputate them. Christopher Marshall wrote that on January 7th, ten teams of oxen fit for slaughtering came into camp driven by local Philadelphia women. They also brought 2,000 shirts smuggled from the city, sewn under the eyes of the enemy. Most Americans did not know how dire the situation was. A five-man congressional delegation arrived on January 24th, consisting of Francis Dana of Massachusetts, Nathaniel Folsom of New Hampshire, John Harvey of Virginia, Governor Morris of New York, and Joseph Reed of Pennsylvania. Washington and his aides convinced them to implement recommendation reforms to the supply department. Congress appointed Nathaniel Green as quartermaster general. He did not want this position, but he accepted it at the behest of Washington. He supplied the troops when the weather and the road conditions began to improve, and when the Schuylkill River thawed. The army could be supplied from the depot at Reading. 
Maintaining sanitary conditions was an extreme undertaking at Valley Forge. Scabies broke out because of the filthy conditions in the encampment, as did many other ailments. There were limited water supplies for cooking, washing, and bathing. When horses died, they often remained laying on the ground, unburied. Washington described the smell of Valley Forge as intolerable. Plumbing did not exist as well as trash collection. Washington ordered his soldiers to burn tar or to burn the powder of muskets in each hut every day to cleanse the air of putrefaction. On May 27th, Washington ordered his soldiers to remove the mud and straw chinking from the huts to render them as airy as possible. Typhoid and dysentery spread in the contaminated food. Influenza and pneumonia spread. Many succumbed to typhus, which was caused by body lice. 1,700 to 2,000 troops died during the Valley Forge encampment, most at hospitals located at six different towns. Valley Forge had the highest mortality rate of any Continental Army encampment, and even most military engagements of the war. Despite the mortality rate, Washington did curb the spread of smallpox. Washington had ordered mass inoculation of his troops in January 1777. A year later, smallpox broke out and an investigation occurred that three to 4,000 troops had not received inoculations. Washington ordered inoculations for any soldier vulnerable to disease, a precursor to vaccinations. They gave the patient a milder form of smallpox, which led to better recovery rates than if they had gotten the disease naturally. This provided lifetime immunity for the disease. This was the first large-scale state-sponsored immunization campaign in history. Baron Frederick Wilhelm von Steuben arrived at Valley Forge on February 23, 1778, a supposed lieutenant general in the Prussian army. He was sent to America by the American ambassador to France, Benjamin Franklin. He reported for duty as a volunteer. One soldier's first impression of the Baron was of the ancient fable, the God of War. Washington appointed von Steuben as temporary inspector general. He went out into the camp to talk with the officers and men, inspected the huts, and scrutinized their equipment. He established standards of sanitation and camp layouts that would be standardized a century and a half later. Men relieved themselves wherever they wished. And when an animal died, the meat was stripped and the rest laid a rot. He laid out a plan to have rows for command officers and enlisted men. Kitchens and latrines were on the opposite side of camp, with latrines on the downhill side. Stoyben picked 120 men from various regiments to form a model company. He used them to demonstrate military training in turn to train the other personnel at regimental and brigade levels. With the eccentric personality in full military dress uniform, twice a day he trained the soldiers who were lacking in proper clothing. His secretary transferred the drills from German to French and Washington's secretary transferred it to English. They did that every single night so Washington could command his soldiers in the morning. The Baring's willingness and ability to work with the men as well as his use of profanity in many different languages made him popular among the soldiers. American officers felt threatened by this. American officers had accepted the British practice of letting the sergeants drill the men as it was thought that it would be ungentlemanly for officers to do so. Von Steuben was not actually a lieutenant general. The highest rank he had achieved in the Prussian army was captain. Historians believe Ben Franklin is the one who lied about his credentials. Each hut housed a squad of 12 enlisted soldiers. Sometimes soldiers' families joined them too, to share that space. Throughout the encampment, 250 to 400 women followed their husbands or sweethearts to Valley Forge, sometimes even their children. Washington wrote this, The multitude of women in particular, especially those who are pregnant or have children, are a clog upon every movement. The women earned income by washing clothes or nursing the troops, which kept the men cleaner and healthier. Martha Washington traveled in wartime with a group of slaves over bad roads, reaching her destination in February. She was met at the Susquehanna Ferry Dock by Colonel Richard Meade. He was going to escort her to the encampment. She organized meals and kept spirits high during the rough times of the encampment. 
Valley Forge had a high percentage of racial and ethnical diversity. The Continental Army was composed of soldiers from all 13 states. 30% of the soldiers did not speak English as their first language. Nearly 10% of Washington's army consisted of African American troops. A number of Native Americans served as soldiers, mainly from Rhode Island. It had difficulty meeting quotas for soldiers. Many served as scouts to keep an eye out for British raiding parties and fighting under Lafayette at Barren Hill. France had been reluctant to involve themselves in the war against Great Britain. They were worried that revolutionary fever might spread to their own empire, which it eventually did in 1789. But they also did not think the American colonists would win. But the October 1777 surrender of British General John Burgoyne's army at Saratoga won the assistance they needed from other foreign powers. France and the United States signed a treaty on February 6, 1778 creating a military alliance between the two countries. In response to this, Britain declared war on France on March 17, 1778. On May 6, George Washington, having already received word of the French alliance, he ordered the Continental Army to perform a formal ceremony, consisting of rapid and sequential firing of guns down the ranks. Continental officer George Ewing wrote, The troops then shouted, Three cheers and long live the King of France. After this, three cheers and shouts of God saved the friendly powers of Europe, and cheers and shout of God saved the American state. Each soldier received an extra grill of rum, about four ounces, to enjoy that day. And after the troops were dismissed, Washington and his officers drank in many patriotic toasts and concluded the day with harmless mirth and jollity. Desertions happened at Valley Forge, especially during the toughest of times. Men were hanged for desertion to set an example for other soldiers. The Battle of Monmouth would be the first time the army would use his training learned at Valley Forge. The battle began badly for the Americans when Lee launched an attack on the British rear guard at Monmouth Courthouse. A counterattack by the main British column forced Lee to retreat until Washington arrived with the main body. Clinton disengaged when he found Washington in an unassailable defensive position and returned to the march to Sandy Hook. Clinton had divided his army into two divisions on the march from Philadelphia. The first division had most of the combat troops, while the second was made up of mostly heavy transport of 1,500 baggage wagons. The British were harassed by a strong American force as they traveled to New Jersey. When the British left Monmouth Courthouse the next day, Lee attempted to isolate the rear guard and defeat them. The attack was coordinated poorly. The Americans were outnumbered, and the British 1st Division returned. Some of Lee's units began to withdraw, leading to a breakdown in command, forcing Lee to order a general retreat. A fiercely fought rear guard action by the vanguard gave Washington time to deploy the main body in a strong defensive position. The infantry attack gave way to a two-hour artillery duel, during which Clinton began to disengage. The duel ended when a Continental Brigade established artillery on a hill overlooking the British lines, forcing Clinton to withdraw his artillery. Washington launched two small attacks on Clinton's infantry when they withdrew, inflicting heavy casualties on the British during the second one. Washington attempted to probe the British flanks. It was halted by sunset. The two armies camped within one mile of one another. The British army retreated during the night unnoticed by the Americans. Linking up with the baggage train, the rest of the march to Sandy Hook was completed without further incident, and Clinton's army sailed to New York. The battle was inconclusive. Neither side landed the blow they hoped on to one another, but Washington's army remained an effective force in the field. But the British redeployed successfully to New York. Both sides sustained a considerable amount of casualties, though the majority were heat-related illness and exhaustion rather than combat. The Continental Army is estimated to have inflicted more loss than it received, and it was one of the rare occasions when Americans retained possession of the battlefield. 
Washington's army had proven itself to be much more improved after the training that went on over the winter in Valley Forge, and the professional conduct of the American troops during the battle was widely noted by British troops. Washington was able to present the battle as a triumph, and he was voted a formal thanks by Congress to honor the important victory of Monmouth over the British Grand Army, and his position as Commander-in-Chief became unassailable. Valley Forge for a long time occupied a prominent place in the United States storytelling. One of the most enduring myths about Valley Forge concerns the weather conditions. Depictions describing the encampment as being blanketed in snow with the exposure and frostbite supportedly claiming the lives as as many soldiers. Amputations did occur, but no cooperating sources state that death occurred from freezing temperatures alone. Rather, the snowfall occurred infrequently and above freezing temperatures were regular and ice was uncommon. Another popular myth involves George Washington kneeling in the snow, praying for his army for salvation. The image has been popularized in paintings and sculptures, but no contemporary evidence exists suggesting such a prayer occurred. Valley Forge was indeed a tough and arduous encampment, but Washington himself exaggerated the plight that his army was in, and often wrote out false dispatches he knew would fall into enemy hands. One example wrote, Sirs, it is with great encouragement that I write to inform you that our army has drastically improved. With the arrival of the New Jersey militia, our numbers of enlisted regiments has just reached 40,000 fully uniformed. Valley Forge was an important time for our young army. George Washington was not yet the de facto leader. He often faced his subordinate officers trying to take his position, but after the army came out, a strong fighting force, Washington was the definitive leader of the Continental Army. And that is the story of Valley Forge. Many archaeological expeditions have gone in and they have found tons and tons of bones of animals. So it is believed by a lot of historians and archaeologists that they had a lot to eat and that there were quite a bit of exaggerations that took place at Valley Forge. Again, Washington was in charge of 12,000 people. The largest city at that time was a little over 40,000 in Philadelphia. 40,000 people, largest city, 12,000. It was the size of of Charleston, South Carolina. Just the army alone. Incredible. So he had to get a ton of food. Imagine having to come up with enough food for 12,000 people day in and day out for six months. While you're doing that, you have to make an entire city for these people to live in out of nothing. And before Von Steuben came, I mean, they were just going to the bathroom wherever they pleased, and disease was rampant. Him coming from Europe and having basically the European armies at that time were the elite armies, especially the Prussian army. And when he saw the conditions these soldiers were in, he was shocked. They, they had latrines running through the middle of the tents, just everywhere. It was horrible. He whipped him into shape and he severely, even though he actually wasn't a lieutenant general, he was just a captain, but he knew what he was doing and he severely brought the army up to snuff. So I hope you enjoyed. I sure had fun making it. Leave a like, comment, everything down below, and we will see you on the next. Peace!